Good day. My name is Kaikuya Calhoun and this is my presentation for the Western Governors University Oral Capstone. A little bit of background on myself. I'm married for uh, 15 years with three children. I've been a member of the Air Force for 17 years. I uh, live in countries like uh, South Korea, Germany, England, as well as visiting and performing uh, temporary duties in several other countries. I currently reside in Jacksonville, Arkansas, which is a small town about 20 minutes outside of uh, the city of Little Rock. I will be moving to the Seattle, Tacoma, Washington area in the upcoming month. My current position in the Air Force recruiting is our recruiting area supervisor for Central Arkansas. And what this means is that I uh, supervise anywhere from seven to nine recruiters and uh, one civilian in the uh, Air Force recruiting. I'll teach them how to bring in civilians, uh, motivate them, train them on all those type of things. And I've been doing this uh, for about three and a half years. Upon my move to Washington, I will advance to the position of senior trainer. And that job will entail me uh, being responsible for training uh, a group of recruiters in the uh, states of Alaska, Washington, and uh, Oregon. So that will be a really big challenge, and I'm looking forward to that challenge. The position that I would like to obtain in my career is the position of squadron superintendent, uh, recruiting squadron superintendent. And what that position is, is basically the superintendent runs the entire squadron, so it's in charge of everything. Uh, for bringing civilians into the Air Force, uh, operations, finance, marketing, uh, morale issues, all those things fall under the umbrella of superintendent. Now there are only 24 Air Force recruiting squadrons throughout the country, so that means there can only be 24 superintendents uh, or that, in that position. So it's only the select few that make it to this position. My reason for uh, wanting to become one of these select few it was not just the sole reason to become one of those select few, but it's out of love for uh, my country and the Air Force. Uh, I believe in the Air Force, I believe in what we do, and it's allowed me to live and visit places that I never thought I would dream of, allowed me to have experience that I probably couldn't even fathom as a kid. Uh, I met my wife in the Air Force, furthered my education in the Air Force, uh, started a family in the Air Force, um, all those things. I entered the Air Force as a 18 year old kid so my entire adulthood has been spent in the Air Force that's kind of helped shape and mold my views and uh, make me live out the experiences that, that I've done so what I wanted to do by doing by becoming a recruiter is kind of tell everyone about my Air Force experience about the Air Force experience and the opportunities that that we have because I know what this institution has done for me so at my 10 year mark, uh, that's when I decided to become a recruiter and I've been doing it well ever since. So what today I'm going to talk about is uh, my, my selected career path and highlighting the qualifications for my path. Uh, the areas that I will be talking about are uh, leading peoples and teams, developing sustainable solutions, serving customers, managing products and services, technology and innovation, assessing the competitive environment, and planning for the future in the global marketplace. Uh, we'll start off or get started with leading peoples and teams. In the Air Force, we're taught that the two most important elements or ingredients of what we do are the people and the mission, with the people being the most important thing. No matter what new technology uh, we get our hands on, the mission cannot be accomplished without the people. That's why leading people and teams are so important. At my six year mark in the Air Force, that's when I became an official supervisor. After attending uh, required courses of training, leadership schools, uh, I was able to become a supervisor. And I've had major success uh, ever since. I make every effort to know the people that I lead. When I say this, I mean really understanding the person. You have to have a, a deep understanding and knowledge of, uh, of that individual. And what I mean is you have to know the environment that they're from, uh, the experiences that they've had, uh, their goals, what motivates them. All of these things come into play when, when it comes to knowing your people. Um, you have to know what type of things are dangling in front of them to get them to aspire, to try to reach uh, the goals set by the overall mission, to reach their own individual goals, reach team goals, have them achieve things that they know they can do and things that they probably didn't think they could do. Uh, I studied leadership through professional military education and academia. I've conducted research on different leaders and I even stirred up a bit of controversy uh, when I acknowledged the strong leadership 
attitude and uh, attributes possessed by Adolf Hitler during my undergrad studies. Now, I didn't say anything about his human qualities, but the fact that he seized the moment by getting a group of disenfranchised people to believe in his message took leadership skills. Um, I didn't focus on his evil qualities or anything like that, but just the fact that he was able to do that, he had to have leadership skills, uh, and he was very successful to the point where he almost had world control based off of being able to uh, get a group of people to believe in what he was doing and have those, have those people follow him. I studied uh, and I understand team dynamics and the stages that teams go through, such as our forming, norming, storming, performing. It's important to be able to adapt as a leader. There can't be one leadership style for all situations. If that was the case, then uh, there'd be no such thing as situational leadership. So a leader can't be paralyzed uh, by fear when, when change uh, comes about or, or something new. A leader has to not necessarily accept change, but embrace the change. Even if you don't embrace the change, you have to be able to deal with that change in that situation and adapt to whatever is going on. Otherwise, uh, you're going to remain stagnant and not be successful as a leader. You're not going to progress. You're going to digress. I'm a big sports fan, and I like to use Duke University's uh, basketball coach, Coach K, Mike Krzyzewski, as an example of uh, excellent leadership and the way he's able to adapt uh, year after year after year. He's been successful for a long time now. And what Coach K does, he adjusts his team style of play based on the strengths and weaknesses of each player. So instead of having a system, say like a, uh, a Bobby Knight, where if you come to that school when he was at Indiana, if this is my school, this is my system, you have to fit into it, whether that player is capable of fitting into that system or not. Or not. What Coach K does is he adjusts the system. Now there's a foundation, but he adjusts the system to the strength and weaknesses of his players. So he, one year he may have a team that they're, they're pounding the ball inside because they got two or three seven-footers and they're dominant on the inside. The next year he may have a perimeter-oriented team because they have quick and, and younger players or, or the next year he may have a defensive-minded team. And I know that's sports, but you can apply that same thing uh, to any situational leadership. Uh, the recruiters I supervise aren't always the same. Their, their attitudes aren't always the same. The Air Force mission, what they dictate, what type of uh, people that we're looking for, what programs that we're looking for, all that changes on a constant basis. So as a leader, I have to be able to adapt to that and uh, succeed in different situations. And that's what makes me strong, I believe, because I'm able to do that. I was successful as a recruiter. And as a matter of fact, I was a top recruiter uh, in the year 2004 for the Virginia, North Carolina, Washington, D.C., and Baltimore area. And uh, I have the hard way to prove it. Now, this gives me credibility with the people that I lead. Uh, when a recruiter or the people I supervise or any situation, when they see you do something or they see you solve a problem that they couldn't solve themselves, that gives you credibility. That lets them know that you're not just telling them to go out and do something, but you're able to do it as well. And if you don't know how to do it, you need to know how to either either find a way to do it, find someone who knows how to do it, or, or learn how to do it to have that credibility. What you want for your recruiters to do is believe in what, you, what you're doing. So I, I coach and train them through lecture, uh, simulation, or real world demonstration. If your uh, people believe in you, uh, you get that door open to doing greater things. So in, in my three years uh, tenure as a flight chief or area supervisor, my team has been the top team two out of those three years, and the year we didn't win, we finished number two. And more importantly, the people that I supervise, the ones that have progressed and moved on, they went on to lead their own teams. They went on to do bigger and better things. And I think that's the true legacy of a leader is did you manage that person or did you lead that person? Did you uh, develop that person, inspire that person, and teach that person how to teach the next one? Or did you just try to create a clone of yourself or, or, or just a puppet? And you don't want that, especially in Air Force, we don't want that. If I'm a squadron superintendent, I don't want a bunch of clones uh, or mocking, mocking me doing everything I say. What I want is diversity. I want people to bring new ideas, people to be able to train the next person, people to be able to lead their smaller teams. And that's what you have to strive for as a leader.